Well, as I mentioned earlier, I'm Pastor Brent. For those of you I maybe haven't met, and I'm the executive pastor here at Mission, and uh, it's my privilege uh, to continue on our series this morning. Uh, it's complicated. But before we do that, if you didn't get one of these when you came in, just a reminder, this Thursday night is our Celebrate Recovers, Recovery's 11th anniversary. That should get us excited, yeah. If you're 11 years old, raise your hand. Yes! Dude, CR has been going as long as you've been living. That's awesome. But they're going to have an awesome celebration this Thursday night, and it's open to everybody. Free taco bar? Say no more, okay, at 6 o'clock. And then at 7 o'clock, Scott Spezio. How many have heard that name before? Former Cardinals baseball player. Uh, will be with us uh, being our main speaker on Thursday night. So take, hope you can take a chance and be with us on Thursday night. But like I said, we're back in continuing on, on our, in our complicated series, and today we're looking at this idea, does God care who I vote for? In just a few weeks, we are going to be gathering around tables with friends and family for the holidays and enjoying some great turkey and other great food. And guess what we always say when you go to those gatherings? What are the two things you're not supposed to talk about? Politics and religion. Guess what we're going to do today? Bam! We're going to blow it out of the water and speak about both today, okay? So hang on, Mama. This could get crazy, all right? But we're going to speak about both this idea of politics and how does our faith uh, fill into that. Politics is one of those areas people hold tightly to. Uh, there's party allegiances, there's issues that are primary, and we have different views of what government should be and its role in our life. But it is part of who we are as Americans. I remember November 4th, 1986, in Hawthorne Elementary School, I cast my first vote. Hawthorne Elementary, beautiful school, can you tell? More like, eh, it was holding up, go down in the dingy basement, cast my vote, and I was so excited. And since that vote, I have had the privilege to vote in many elections just like you have. And I'll be honest, some elections I've been on the edge of my seat just feeling like, okay, God, if so-and-so doesn't get into office, man, we are doomed. we got to get them in the office. On other occasions, I've been kind of apathetic. Kind of like, ah, does my vote really count? I don't really know more, most of these people. I don't really care. And I bet for some of us, as we've talked about politics before, it's kind of like choosing between the, the least of the two evils or more. Our political landscape has definitely divided us in so many different ways. Like I said, there's the uber intense, the M M MSNBC or the Fox News guys, the talk radio people that just get us so wound up and so tight that we know I've got to get the word out. This has got to be the way it's got to go. To those on the other side that really could care less and don't want to be, have any part of it and thinking, what difference does my vote make? Our church family has that same issue. We have people in our church family who are uber intense about their politics. And is that wrong? No. We have people in this church that are pretty apathetic about their politics. Is that wrong? Well, not necessarily. No. We have registered Republicans sitting here. We have registered Democrats. We have independents. We have green parties. We have social. We have all kinds of crazy people here this morning. And we make up the body of Christ. So we open up this can of worms today and tackle this topic because 2024 is right around the corner. Have you heard anything about that yet? 
Man, they're already starting to go crazy. And let me tell you, if you think it's getting mad right now, it's going to get even more crazier as this political season just wraps up more and more and more. And so today, I'm kind of like a coach sitting down his team saying, hey guys, here's what's coming on the field when you hit the field today. Here's what you're going to experience and how should you deal with it. And so today, in our message today, I'm going to do my best in these few moments just to help clarify and clear up for us just some things to be watching for as we look forward to 2024 and how we can best live our lives as followers of Jesus in a world that sometimes feels like it's gone crazy. Does God care who I vote for in 2024? Does God care? I believe, yes, he does. But I also believe God cares more about his kingdom than just who I vote for. If you have your Bibles, would you take those out with you this, with me this morning? Turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And once you got your Bibles out, would you stand with me for the reading of the word this morning? And we're just going to read a couple short verses to launch us off today. Familiar passage to many of us. As Paul the Apostle writes this in verse 1 of chapter 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. If you know anything about the Apostle Paul, he was that crazy guy that he, he was after Christians. He had nothing to do with them. He was trying to destroy the early movement of Christ's followers. And he had an incredible encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. And God did an amazing work in his life. And Paul became one of the greatest thinkers, teachers, and preachers, and one of the main voices of the early church. And the book of Romans is kind of his main, uh, what should we say, explanation of the gospel, theology, and what the life of a Christian should look like. And up through verses, up through chapters 11 in Romans, Paul has been laying out one theological concept after another, from salvation to redemption to justification to sanctification and any other Asian you can think of, okay? He's been doing all of that, and he gets to chapter 12, and he kind of turns the corner a little bit, and he says, now here's how you live it out. Here's the practical part. And so I use this verse today as a jumping off point to remind us, Paul said, I want you now, here's how you are to live. I want you to live as a living sacrifice for the Lord. I want your identity to be found as a child of the king, living as a sacrificial person for his will and for his kingdom. So today I want to give you some reminders that scripture gives us about our government and politics. Just some reminders, and then we're going to get into some application of how does this deal with us. Here's the first thing I want you to be reminded of that scripture tells us about. Scripture reminds us that God is the ultimate power source. God is the ultimate power source. Romans 13.1 says it this way, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by who? By God. Paul wanted his early listeners and readers to understand that even those that were in authority over them, and these were not nice people at Paul's time, the people didn't have a vote. They were living in an in a empire that had overtaken them. But yet Paul reminds them 
Those that God has put in authority over you are there because of God's work in hand. We have the privilege to live in a democratic republic today here in the U.S. that gives us the amazing privilege to vote. And let me tell you, we need to let our voice be heard. Amen? We need to be people that take part in that. Most of the world today would give anything to have the chance to vote and to speak into their uh, political system. But I like what Tony Evans says on this, just to balance this out a bit. The Bible says that God puts up kings and tears kings down. So your vote, whoever you voted for, is never the final say-so. Now you are to vote. We are to participate. But heaven rules. It's kind of this amazing dichotomy that God asks us to do our part. But is our part the final word? No. God's part is the final word. He is the final say. So the reminder for us today is God is the ultimate power broker. Here's the second thing that the scriptures remind us of, is that we are ultimately kingdom citizens. We might have American voting registration cards. We might be citizens of this land, but we are ultimately kingdom citizens. Listen to how Paul says this in Philippians. He says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savor from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our citizenship is in heaven. That's what scripture tells us. We are not Americans who happen to be Christian, but rather we are Christ followers who happen to live in America. And I think sometimes we can get, get that out of balance. We need to be reminded we are citizens of the kingdom. Peter said that we're chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. We've been set aside for his work and what he wants to accomplish. Our number one citizenship is for God's kingdom. That's why I wore this sweatshirt today. I'm not usually a sweatshirt guy, but I wore it today and I asked Cher if I could put the shirt underneath just to make it look a little fancy. And she said, oh, I think you'll pass. So we're okay today. If it looks like I came from the 80s, that's all right. I came from the 80s, okay? But Paul even goes on in Galatians and he says, there's neither Greek nor Jew, there's neither slave nor free, there's not male or female, but you're all one in Christ. And so sitting here today, you're not just a Democrat or a Republican or an Independent or a Green Party card holder or whatever you are, ultimately you are a child of God and you're a citizen of Christ's kingdom. You're a citizen of Christ's kingdom. Thirdly, Scripture tells us we are exiles. We are exiles. Exile is a person who has been taken from their homeland and is in another place for a period of time. This isn't their home. Sometimes we can get very comfortable in this world and even in our country of America and just, oh, this is awesome. Let's just sit here. But this is not our eternal home, friends. Peter says it this way. He says, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. He says, he calls us foreigners. Each and every one of us today are foreigners. We're exiles in this land. This is not our home. So I want you to be reminded of that. Fourth and last thing the scripture says, Reminds us, reminds us of many other things, but I just want to leave you with these four. And this is a pa familiar passage, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are imperfect people. That person sitting next to you is imperfect, and how many say amen? You're not supposed to say that. You might get, okay, don't say that. I was just kind of pushing you through. Oh, boy, I'll get in trouble later for that one. Okay, we're all imperfect people, and yet what we're striving for is per a perfect life. Guess what? That's not going to happen in this world. And as well, we are imperfect voters. When we go to cast our vote, we are imperfect. We don't always get it right. And guess who we're voting for? 
imperfect candidates. We are voting for imperfect people. The last time I looked, Jesus isn't running in this election. There's no perfect person out there. Nor is there only any wholly perfect candidate at any level of our governmental system. Our system itself is flawed. Our voting and election practices are not heaven on earth as we have discovered over the last few years. We are given the unenviable task of choosing the candidates we feel best will, that we feel best will offer our city, our county, our state, and our nation the best opportunity for prosperity and peace. This is not easy. And this is not without differences of opinion and without controversy. You take an imperfect voter plus imperfect candidates and expect a perfect solution, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. So what are we supposed to do with all this? What are we supposed to do? Let me give you some responses today of how we are to live. First one is this, love. Love. How are we to live? Love. Let love flow out of your life. We're, first of all, citizens of Christ's kingdom. And what's Christ's kingdom about? Love. Love your neighbor as yourself. John said it directly, said God is love. And if God is love and we're following in his kingdom, that ought to be what shows from us. Will there be people we disagree with in 2024? How many believe that? Yeah. Yeah. Amen, brother. Preach it. There's people I disagree with on 2023 already. Okay. Wait till you get to 2024. I can disagree and be upset, but I'm still called to love. Listen to Jesus' words in, 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 in the Gospel of Matthew. He said, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And how many would go, that, I love that one right there. Okay, man, sign me up for this statement. I, I want to live that today. But Jesus goes on, but he says, but I tell you, this is what you learn. This is your society. This is what your world does around you. They love their neighbors and they hate their enemies. But he says, I tell you, as members of my kingdom, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He said, your identity is as a child of the king. And as a child of the king, you operate differently than those in the world around you. He said, love your enemies. Doesn't mean you got to agree with them. There will be a political opponents, friends, and family that think differently. But you can still love. Our great theologian and philosopher on staff, Eric Swanson, our pastor over at the Morris campus, said it this way. He said, learn to disagree without dismissing. Learn to disagree without dismissing. We're in a cancel society today, cancel culture that, man, if you don't agree with us, boom, we're canceling you out. Well, that's what the world does. But Jesus followers, kingdom people, we can learn to disagree without dismissing. We can show love and honor to those we disagree with. We can show honor and love even to the authorities that are placed over us by our God, even though we don't agree with everything. We've often used the phrase, you know, I honor the position, but I don't have to honor the person. Well, that is true. You honor the position, and you don't have to honor the person. You're called to love them. You're called to love them. So love, let that be a cornerstone of 2024 for you, to love in the midst of all that's going on around. Here's my second thought for you this morning. Live your citizenship. 
Live your true citizenship. Don't hide in the shadows afraid to be seen or your voice heard. There's been Christians for hundreds and thousands of years who have thought the best practice was to be was to separate themselves from society and pull away and just go live in, on the top of a mountain somewhere and wait for Jesus to come. And wouldn't that be awesome if that was the way Christ's kingdom worked? I'd sign me up, get me out of here. But that's not going to be the effective way that Christ has called us to. He's called us to be a light where? In the darkness. Let us be people that see the opportunities around us to impact our world and be Christ's light in the darkness. It's interesting, in the Old Testament, the prophet Jeremiah gives the exiles of Israel some instructions of how they are to live. They've been taken out of their homeland of Israel due to judgment God's brought upon them, and they've been come into this Babylonian empire that is anything Jewish about it, has nothing. They're trying to, uh, in a sense, pull out the Jewishness of the people. But here's God's word through the prophet Isaiah. This is what the Lord Almighty says to all those I've carried into exile. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. The word of the Lord through Jeremiah to the people of Israel was, do what you can to live in your land and make an impact so that it prospers and that it has peace. If you're one of those that just kind of ignored our political system, you just ignored living here, let me challenge you. Be involved in the land God has placed you. But at the same time, don't make your country, your government, your president, your God but live life to the fullest where God has placed you. We're, you know, we've got those Illinois t-shirts out there and everybody's leaving Illinois. Well, for us, God has planted us in Illinois and I believe he's planted us here for a reason, amen? Oh, bo oh boy. <laughs> Let me... Let's try that again. I believe God has left us in Illinois for a reason. Amen? Yeah. Amen! He has! He's left us here. He's divinely placed us here. Here's the crazy thing. The early first century Jesus followers turned their world upside down. You read not just the Bible, but you read any historical record, and they will tell you that early Jesus followers turned that Roman Empire upside down. Did they do it because they voted so well? Nope. Nope. Sorry to bust some of your bubbles there. Did they do it because they were so mighty in power with their swords? No. You know how they turned a kingdom upside down? is because they, were, they, they realized their ultimate kingdom was in Christ. And they lived out the life of Jesus to those around them. Just think what would happen in this part of Chicagoland if in Manuka and Morris and Plainfield and Shanahan and Cole City and Wilmington and Joliet and all the surrounding areas, if God's people... We're more concerned about living for Christ's kingdom than who they voted for. What would that look like? If we were so concerned about our citizenship in Christ's kingdom, Chuck Colson, who was uh, one of the special counsels for um, Nixon and his crazy fiasco in the 70s, and if you don't know the story of Chuck Colson, amazing story. He was part of the inside work of Watergate, all messed up, gets sent to prison and uh, finds Jesus and really finds Jesus and becomes an incredible spokesperson 
uh, for Christ's kingdom here the last 20, 30 years and recently passed away. But here's what he says. He says, today's misspent enthusiasm for political solutions to the moral problems of our culture arises from a distorted view of both politics and Christianity. Too low a view of the power of a sovereign God and too high a view of the ability of man. The idea that human systems reformed by Christian influence pave the road to the kingdom, or at least to revival, has the same utopian ring that one finds in Marxist literature. And he goes on. It also ignores the consistent lesson of history that shows that laws are most often reformed as a result of powerful spiritual movements, not vice versa. I know of no case where a spiritual movement was achieved by passing laws. Pretty in-your-face, straightforward comments from Chuck Colson. If we want change in our world, if we're looking for change in our communities, yes, we need governmental authority. And as we read earlier, God places them there for us. But what we ultimately need is the kingdom of God to explode in our lives and in our hearts. Tony Evans sums it up this way. He says, our job is to demonstrate what it looks like when the people of God represent the king and how we act, react, and talk. That's going to get tested in 2024. That's going to get tested. How are the people of God going to act, react, and talk in a world that, let's just be honest, gets crazy over politics? As much as each and every one of our votes count, friends, and please hear me out, our votes are needed and they are important. But how much more important is how we live our lives? How do we live our lives for the kingdom of God? Do people see the king through our lives? We need to live it out in the land God has placed us even in Illinois, we can live that out. Thirdly, we need to be people that are learned. Learn, be an educated voter. Educate yourself politically. Learn the process. Don't be uninformed. There are people that have died and given their blood for you to have the privilege to vote. Be an educated voter. Know what you're voting for, who you're voting for. Are there anyone that's perfect out there? No, there is not. But learn. And then finally, be loyal citizens to Christ's kingdom. Be loyal citizens to Christ's kingdom. I love the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6. This is one of my favorite passages. I probably bring it up many times when I speak, but Jesus said this way, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Jesus said, it's so easy to get our eyes on what's right in front of us, our needs for this. We need this political leader. We need that thing. We need this to prosper. We need this to happen. We need this. And Jesus says, seek first God's kingdom. Put God first in all you do. Put God first in how you live your life out. Put God first even in how you talk and how you act and how you react. Put God first. Is the 2024 political season going to be easy? No. The media is going to do all it can to rile us up, to divide us, to get us opposing each other in so many ways, and the enemy could easily have a heyday in 2024 trying to bring division everywhere, including the local church. I pray Mission will be one of those churches that will overcome evil with good. I pray we'll be a church that, you know, doesn't allow that enemy to come in and divide You know what it's like when things are divided at home. Oh, things just don't work well. You know what it's like at work when 
people are divided and at odds with each other. Things just don't work well. The enemy wants nothing more than to divide his people. Let's not let that happen. Because we've read to the end of the book, and who does win? God does. God's kingdom ultimately wins. He prevails. He endures forever. Presidents, kings, prime ministers, governors, congressmen, and senators, they're going to come and they're going to go. But we serve a God whose throne will never be removed. Amen? We serve a God whose throne will always be there. Do we need help politically? Yes, we do. But political solutions are temporal, and his kingdom is eternal. He has a plan, and we have to trust him. May we live out our citizenship in the kingdom. May we live out our number one priority of being Jesus followers. Back to Romans chapter 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. May we each and every day just say, God, I'm yours. Help me to reflect your kingdom rather than my political party. God, help me every day to reflect your will and your way rather than what I think is right today. Help me to reflect you. He goes on, and do not conform to the pattern of this world, which we've been talking about this morning, that is at odds trying to find hope and trying to find solutions just in man's capability. But he says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, is good, pleasing, and perfect will. Like I said earlier, we need to be involved. We need to be active in our political realm. But we need to remember our politicians are not our savior. Jesus is our king. He is our savior. Let me go back to Chuck Colson as we wrap up here today. He says this, kind of wrapping it all. He says, you don't, have, don't change a culture by passing laws. You change a culture by changing people's habits. That's why the gospel is so central to the possibilities of cultural reformation in American life. We want to change our, our country, change our world. We don't need more political rhetoric. We need more of Jesus living out in our life. Does God care who I vote for in 2024? Like I said, yes, I, I believe he does. But he cares even more so how you live your life. May you live a life that reflects your kingdom citizenship. Would you stand with me in prayer? Father in heaven, we live in crazy times. God, as we said, times in which it seems like, God, there is just little hope in some ways. And even in the choosing of our elected officials, God, sometimes it feels like choosing between the less of the evils. But God, I pray that we will be a people that stay true to you no matter what keep our eyes on you no matter what and Lord make remind us today that our salvation is not found in our government it's not found in a politician but our salvation Lord is found in you the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords give us wisdom Lord as we pass through in this world even as we live in Illinois God give us wisdom how to live but God, ultimately, help us keep our eyes on you and what you want to do through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you, friends. Have a great day.